Here we go. One. Two. And, oh, no, no, no. Go away. Go away. And three. Hello, the internet, and welcome back to my channel. Why do I have three PlayStation 3 Fat on my desk in 2022? Well, I'm not sure I know that myself, to be honest, but you might remember this. Uh, this is a previous attempt uh, to repair a PlayStation 3, which unfortunately didn't go very well because uh, I was very close to fixing this board and then I damaged the CPU when I deleted it. So after that video, I felt a bit sorry towards the, let's say, the PlayStation 3 community. Uh, so I went ahead and uh, looked for some uh, other PlayStation 3s uh, locally, and I ended up with these three machines. They are all in need of repair or service. And what I'd like to do here on my channel for the first time is what others call Repairathon, uh, which is gonna be basically try and repair them all and uh, service them all in one go. Uh, whether it's gonna take one episode or more than one episode, I don't know, know yet. Uh, we, we will see this together. So without wasting any further time, I would say, and let's take a look at these PlayStations. So just a quick overview of these three PlayStations I found. I have this one, I would say is the most precious one. Uh, this is the hardware compatible with PlayStation 2. You can see it has the little slot here, which is, is missing the door, but it's no big deal for the uh, memory cards. This is factory sealed. It's absolutely incredible. It's factory sealed. And to be honest, I tested it and it works. So <laughs> as much as I would love not just to leave it alone and, and just let it be, I think this only needs a little bit of service. Disassembling it, clean it, and uh, I know that scares me a bit, but I really would like to delete all these three PlayStations, but that's definitely not the one I want to start with. So I would say I leave this for last. Now, this one on the right is sealed as well. So that's good news because it means that nobody has done anything inside. And this is a classic uh, yellow light of death and uh, it just doesn't start. And so we'll need to take a look. This one is not sealed and it kind of works. It starts up, but then it powers off after a number of seconds. It can be five seconds or 30 seconds. And I have a feeling, as you can see here from my note, it could be as simple as just replacing the power supply. Uh, out of all these three, I think I'll start with this one because I feel, <laughs> and I probably I shouldn't say this, but I feel it could be an easy repair. Okay, the first PlayStation is plugged in. Let me put the microphone close to the PlayStation so you can hear what happens. I think it's important. So as you could hopefully hear, it does start up, uh, but what happens, I can hear, I don't know whether it's the power supply giving up and I don't know whether it could be the electronics just complaining and, and it's actually the unit is switching everything off, but it sounds to me, but I could be mistaken, that the 12 volt rail is failing, the hard drive, I can hear the hard drive switching off abruptly. To be honest, this one, before diving into advanced diagnostic and everything, I have two spare power supplies one of which, by the way, I need to test, which is the one that I repaired. Um, so I would say let's quickly disassemble this one, which is already open, replace the power supply and see if that fixes the problem. Oh my gosh! Right, I know, I know that this is kind of common with game consoles, but this is horrendous, absolutely horrendous. <laughs> Now, my evil plan is not gonna work because uh, this is a newer version of a power supply. It has these spade connectors, while the one I have, it has this round connector. So, I mean, even if it was compatible, just the connectors just won't fit. So <laughs> it's definitely not gonna work, unfortunately. Okay, as I don't have a PlayStation that runs with this power supply, the only way I have is just to test it with uh, the with load manually, basically. So what I've done here, I've got the um, multimeter connected to the output of the power supply and through this crocodile leads, uh, the output of the 12 volt of the power supply is going to these two 8 ohms resistor which are connected in parallel, making a 4 ohm resistor. 
uh, or load actually. At 12 volts, that should account for 36 watts, which is, you know, it's fairly small for this power supply, but it should be enough, hopefully, to show whether the power supply has an issue or not. To turn on the power supply manually, I basically have to short uh, two pins of this wide connector. One pin is for delivering the five volts, the five volts standby every time you just apply power to the unit. And the other pin is basically the motherboard uh, waking up the power supply so the power supply can generate 12 volts. And I have applied a momentary switch here on those pins so I can turn it on and off by just pressing the switch. And obviously the multimeter will tell me whether there's any voltage coming out of the 12 volt connector. So three, two, one, go. And we do have 12 volts and let's see whether it stays on or whether it shuts down after a few seconds. And the power supply has been on for about a minute. Uh, the voltage is spot on 12 volts. I don't see an issue with it. So it looks like the power supply is working totally fine. Uh, I, to be honest, I'd rather go straight to the point and connect to the Syscon of the PlayStation 3, which basically will allow me to see why the PlayStation is switching off. Uh, hopefully, sometimes the messages can be a bit cryptic, but I guess we can give it a go. Right, the board is clean-ish. Uh, the next step is to find where to connect my serial connection to the Syscon chip. Now, if I'm not mistaken, that's the ch Syscon chip, and I think the connections are going to be here somewhere at the back. So let's go and check the website and find out where to connect on this board, which is a DIA-002. Right, so this is from the website. I can see that these three pins here are my uh, TX, RX, and diagnostic pins. And this is the actual board under the microscope. So you can see here the three pins, one, two, and three. So I'm gonna solder cables uh, on those pins and then uh, we'll move on and connect to the serial port. Right, so I got the PlayStation put together. Again, some parts are missing, it doesn't matter at this point. I've got my serial adapter connected to the PlayStation. Again, this is not a Syscon tutorial. Uh, for an excellent tutorial, please, you can watch my previous video, but even that one is not a massive tutorial. I have linked down below a link of a video which is really explaining everything. It's pretty easy, if you have to follow a number of steps, but uh, it's pretty easy. So my computer, my laptop is currently connected by a serial to this Syscon. Now, just a couple of words. What is this Syscon? Syscon, uh, as it says here on this website, is the main power controller chip of the PlayStation 3. It is responsible for powering up the main 12 volts rail of the power supply and various power systems by switching different voltage regulators on the motherboard. Also for configuring, initializing the, the CPU and GPU of the PlayStation itself. What I'm trying to do today is to access to its error log. By checking the error log, what I'd like to see is to know why the PlayStation switched off. So here on the left hand side, you can see I have a DOS prompt. I'm basically about to call this Python um, script, which comes with a package. Again, if you follow the link down below, you will find everything and you find is incredibly useful PDF file, which will tell you step by step how to do it. I'm basically telling the script to connect to COM4 and to look for uh, this specific chip. So let's give it a go and see what happens. Right, okay, I don't get an error message, which is good. Now if I type auth for authorize, hopefully I get this, which is authorize successful, authorization successful. It means that my laptop is naturally connected to the system chip. To get the last error message of this PlayStation, the, the command is error log get zero zero. There we go. And what I'm looking for is the one here in the middle. I think on the right hand side is the date code, which I don't care at the moment. So we have an A0801002. Now here on the internet, and again, I'll link this website uh, down below, uh, you can basically find how to decode the, the error code. Um, so A is always 8, 8, 
AT, it basically means that the error happened when the PlayStation was switched on. And then we have these four categories of error messages. So one, two, three, and four. It's a system error. So let's scroll down where we got the system errors. Here we go. We got 1001, 1002. Basically, this is telling me that there's an issue with power delivery to the RSX chip, which is the graphic chip. Uh, you can see here the 1002 errors are the fingerprint of bad tokens. Now, what are these tokens? Tokens are kind of weird, very flat capacitors that Sony decided to use on PlayStation 3. They're very, very notorious for failing. Lots of people, they just go ahead and replace this capacitor, which is not easy, by the way. Uh, I guess I'll have to show you in a minute. And I guess the next step would be to try and replace these uh, capacitors with something else, which is not straightforward, and you'll understand why in a second. So out of these two chips, this is the chip CPU and this is the GPU or um, RSX. Now, these are the tokens that I was talking about. As you can see, they're very flat and there are two here on this side and two at the bottom of the board. These, unfortunately, they're not very easy to remove. You definitely need a preheating plate. I've seen videos online where people try with the hot air and they just destroy everything. I do have some suitable replacements. Uh, I will have to do some scraping and, and soldering. Now, the other thing is I could replace them all, like all four, but what I see online is people usually uh, replace one at a time and see when this PlayStation becomes stable. Um, as much as I don't like the idea of just replacing one capacitor and, and if it works, happy days, but maybe maybe this is the, the path I will take. But let me get the replacements and let me at least remove one of these capacitors and see what happens. When removing components from a board like a PlayStation, which is made of multiple layers and it has very large ground planes, it is really important to have a preheater like this one I have. Um, failing to do that, basically what happens is any hot air that you're blowing into the component, the, the heat will be sucked away from these ground planes and the inner layers and all the components around them. So the only solution would be to crank up the a uh, hot air station to stupid temperatures like 500 degrees Celsius. These components slash boards are not designed to withstand these temperatures. So instead what I'm going to do, I'm going to preheat the board to something about 150 or 180 degrees. And then with uh, hot air around 300 degrees, I'm going to just uh, remove the components that I need to remove. These are the capacitors. I think the I think the tantalum capacitors, which I purchased some time ago from AliExpress, as you could imagine, these are not really, uh, let's, go, let's say, solder and play, not plug and play. I can't just replace the tokens in one go and just happy days. I will have to adapt these to the boards. These are, I think they're 470 microfarad. And so that means that to replace one of these, which I believe are 1200 microfarad, I need four, uh, three of these. So let me remove a couple of these capacitors first, and then I'll show you what I have in mind uh, to adapt these trans uh, capacitors to the board. Right, here I have one of the capacitors. As you can see, they have this weird connection at the back, uh, at the bottom. Uh, the, the big pad in the middle is the negative, and the two at the sides, the two stripes at the sides, are the positive stripes. On this type of PlayStation, it's 1000 microfarad, and I think it's 2.5 volts. Let's uh, try and read what's the capacitance um, at this moment on this unit to see whether it's uh, still within specs. And here I'm checking with my Fluke, which is not the most accurate from my point of view, but anyways. And we have 989, which I feel for 1000 microfarad is probably totally fine. Now, obviously, it depends what happens when this thing is uh, running with some load. I mean, not that you apply a load in a capacitor, but when you have voltage and, I don't know, 100 watts running uh, across the line. It's kind of bad news because these capacitors look to be fine, but obviously that's all I can do is just replace them. 
Now, I got this Tantalum for another PlayStation, to be honest, which uh, had the 1200 microfarad capacitors. Uh, let me say, if I install three of these per each of these capacitors, it will be a bit overkilled. What I could do, I could install two on one pad and three on the other one. So I should have basically the same capacitance. The bottom line is, as long as you have the same capacitance, it should be fine. And with five of these capacitors, which are not cheap, I will have 2,350, so I have a little extra, but not too much, which is probably not necessary. So here are the pads on the motherboard. As you can see, you've got the two one in the middle. Uh, I believe these are the negative pads. And then you have the two positives here at each end. Unfortunately, these capacitors are just slightly too big. Now, I've seen uh, someone installing them at an angle of something like this. Uh, I guess it's doable, even though I feel that these ones are a bit too big. Uh, I guess you probably can do that with the 320 microfarad. These are the 420. So in order to use the 420, and please ignore the orientation uh, right now, what I'm going to do, I will have to sand away some of the solder mask, the green solder mask, so that I can solder the negative pad onto the negative pad here on the motherboard. It feels to me it's the more elegant way, to be honest, rather than doing anything else. So I'll get my Dremel and let's see if I can do something decent. Okay, I'm going to try and solder these capacitors. I'd like to try and avoid using the hot air. Again, this board is really sucking away all the, the heat that I'm throwing at it. So I will have to use the preheating board anyways, and then I'll try and use a large-ish solder tip and solder the positive um, end first, which is the one with the stripe. And once the positive is soldered, I'll try and solder the negative here. Now, I have a feeling the preheater and the soldering iron might not be enough for that. So what I've done here, I've got this, this is, I think it's called a magic arm, I purchased from AliExpress for very little, it's very useful. I've basically clamped my hot air nozzle onto this and I can just give it a little help if I see that I'm unable to solder. Well, as you might have noticed, I've changed my mind while I was doing it and I decided to use in the hot air. Uh, reason is, that obviously, obviously now I'm using uh, lead solder, it's not lead free, and it's so much easier to flow. I, I obviously, you know, the temperature, the melting temperature is 180 degrees, it's not 220. So when I realized that, to be honest, a little bit of hot air was enough with the preheater running, obviously, to flow everything, you know, I just decided to give it a quick reflow. I feel uh, this is a good job. Uh, I don't know what you think about it. So I've got five of these capacitors, and all I need to know now is to wait till the board is cold, give it a clean cover up with a little captain tape just to avoid any contact, and then try the PlayStation and see if it works. Okay, I've got the PlayStation reassembled without the drive. It should work. I'm not 100% sure, but it should. And uh, got power plugged in. Also decided to be optimistic and I have an HDMI cable connected to it. But I would say, let's see, let's power it up and let's see what happens. Well, it's loading, which is good. And I have a picture on screen, almost. Mm, I have a black screen. I have Sony on screen, look at that. Wow. Well, it's never been on for so long. So that's an excellent sign, even though I have to say this, apparently 
even just by warming up those capacitors, most of the time they come back to life. So uh, I will have to stress test this uh, console, of course. But you know what? Uh, because it's staying, uh, it's staying on for more than two seconds, I would say let's plug the, you know, let's fully reassemble the thing and then we'll plug a controller and run something and see what happens. And here we go. We are on the, how's it called, the XMB. Right, I'm not a gamer, but I have a game that we can try. I have Need for Speed, Hot Pursuit. Let's see if the Blu-ray disc works. It's a bit noisy. Ah, but there it is. And it's starting. And the game is starting. Uh, the Blu-ray player has got pretty noisy, so I guess I'll have to open it up and maybe give up. I was thinking of giving it a clean, uh, but this time, at this stage, or you know, I need to make sure, I need to see what happens, why it is so noisy. But yeah, this is the first game. Again, I'm not a massive, I'm not a gamer guy, so please don't, don't shoot me. <laughs> but yeah, it works. Now, obviously, the capacitors I've installed, oops, <laughs> the capacitors I've installed, they have like, what is that, one and a half time the capacitance of the, the two I've removed. So even if the other two at the back of the boards are not working properly, hopefully those two new capacitors can kind of compensate with them. But the only thing I can do, the only way to test this PlayStation and make sure that everything really works is to use it. I really haven't got time. And again, I'm not a gamer, so I don't feel like spending hours playing. There are some games which you can leave running and they actually stress the, the CPU and GPU quite a lot. Uh, maybe run some thermal cycles. So, you know, leave it off at night and on again the following day and, all, and off again and on again. But so far, so good. I'm pretty, pretty happy. And I'd like to say it's probably the first time I'm actually repairing a PlayStation 3, which is not just cleaning it and replace the thermal paste. So happy days. Yeah, I actually ended up first. <laughs> So yeah, you know what, uh, let's take a look at this Blu-ray player. It's a bit noisy and uh, yeah, I wanted to open it anyways. Right, I started the PlayStation with the uh, Blu-ray cover off and unfortunately the noise is still there. Right, I've got a problem here because as you can see I managed to, don't ask me how, but I managed to spin the disc without, yeah, let's call it a mechanic, and it's still making this noise. I can't figure out where this noise is coming from. Um, it's kind of weird that it's coming from the motor itself. It, it feels like something vibrating, some plastic vibrating somewhere, but I can't figure out what it is. And I, you know, more than removing half of the disc of half of the drive, I don't really know what to try. So I guess I will tinker with it a bit more, but chances are I may not, I might not be able to fix this one, unfortunately. Unfortunately, I cannot just replace the drive with another one. First, because I don't have an identical one, and it turns out there are many different models of Blu-ray players for the PlayStation 3. Uh, this one is a BND-011. Also, because the PCB board of the drive is married to each PlayStation 3. That means that even if I replace the drive with an identical one, it would not be recognized by the PlayStation. So I would need to find an identical drive, swap the PCB with the one from the noisy drive, and then it should work. Or alternatively, I could just source an identical motor assembly and replace it. For now, I'm going to leave it as it is. If I get this PlayStation 3 fully working, I'll leave the drive issue to someone else. More on this later. Now, let's go ahead and fully test this console to make sure it's actually fixed. Now, I've been testing this in my living room and it's been working totally fine. It's been on for days. I've been playing some games on it and I've been switching it on and off in the morning when it's cold, when it's hot, and it never failed. It never really had any issues whatsoever. So I'd like to consider this repaired, which is great. <laughs> now, as part of this video, as much as I'm a bit reluctant uh, in doing it, um, I really would like to delete these, all these PlayStations, because it's, you know, it's kind of part of the refurbishment. Um, so, with, uh, I feel bold tonight, so I will disassemble this one and we'll start with the uh, graphic chip and then we'll try the CPU. Right, I think I'm going to attempt deleting the RSX on this older uh, PS3 uh, board. Uh, that's the one I damaged the CPU. I'm kind of planning to replace the CPU at some point, 
But you know, if I need to damage something, if you need to experiment on something, I'd rather damage this one, which is already damaged, rather than that one, which might work. Fair enough. Now, there's plenty of tutorials online. Obviously, Sony never really designed these chips uh, to be the lid. One uh, method that you can find online is basically to pry the top of the, uh, well, the heatsink, the IHS open using something like this and putting some maybe paper on the, the bottom of the PCB to protect it from scratches. Now, to be honest, it feels like you're applying such a huge stress on the PCB itself when you are prying this open. Uh, I don't really like the method, uh, so I'm gonna use, let's say my own method, even though I found a YouTube video where someone is doing something similar. Um, I'm gonna use this paint knife spatula, uh, which is very, very thin. I'm gonna use it as a base, so I'm gonna slide the spatula inside like this, and then what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna use this tool, which barely fits in, to be honest, just to pry open the IHS. Now, this way, the pressure of the tool is gonna to be spread by a metal surface rather than ending up directly on the PCB. So hopefully that's gonna be enough to, to basically um, prevent damage to the PCB itself. Now, before I do that, I will have to heat up the IHS. What I'm gonna do, I want the heat basically to reach the, the components where the IHS is attached to but I don't want the heat to reach the base of the board. So I guess it's gonna be like a high temperature for not too much time so that I don't soften up the, the BGA balls, basically. Um, so let me try, let me see what I can do and wish me luck. <laughs> well, that works, worked pretty well, I feel. I honestly felt very little resistance from the IHS itself. It felt pretty spongy, so I call it a big success. Right, here's the, the board out. Let's begin with the RSX. Again, I'm going to warm up uh, especially the edges of the RSX, and then I'm, I'm gonna use the spatula as a protection for the PCB, and this tool as a lever or lever uh, to pry out and remove the IHS. I have to admit that, that, I mean, unless I've done some damage, which I don't know about, this is definitely much, fa much easier and faster than that one. But uh, yeah, it seems to have worked. To delete the CPU, I have decided to go with the spatula method, which basically consists in pushing a spatula or paint a knife uh, into the silicon to cut it. This is the spatula I got recommended, but I did a little tweak on it. I sharpened it, but only on one side. So the spatula now has this angled shape, and my idea is that when the blade is pushed through the silicon, it will be naturally pushed upwards staying away from the PCB and hopefully avoiding damage. That has taken me a while with some fine wet sanding paper and elbow grease. Let's see if that was worth the time. And for the CPU, similar treatment, but I'm gonna use my sharpened painter knife here and a little bit of lubricant. I'm not sure how relevant that is, but I, I think it helps. And it looked like, looks like it worked. One thing is I never realized the IHS has a little step 
in here. So at the beginning I was trying, I was basically trying to pry my painter knife on the aluminium itself. And that's why <laughs> it wasn't going in. So, you know, if you try and doing it, what you have to do, you have to find where actually the silicon starts. And then it's actually pretty soft, to be honest. I... So the next step would be to remove the silicon from the CPU, clean everything, reassemble everything, cross our fingers and hope for the best. Right, I'm ready to reinstall the IHS and reinstall everything, put everything together, hope for the best, hope for the best, and uh, and test it. So let's begin with sticking the IHS back. I know you can do IHS first on the heatsink, and then and then you put the the board on top of the IHS. I think I put the IHS first on the GPU and CPUs first, though. Hopefully this is the perfect amount of thermal paste. Everything is put back together. Every single screw, it, this is good to go. Besides the top panel, which for whatever reason I can't totally, completely slide in. Not sure whether maybe it's coming from a different PlayStation or maybe I'm doing something wrong. But anyways, uh, it's time to power up. And three, two, one, go. Doing something? Yes. Yes, this is working, fantastic. So this is my first successful deleting of both GPU and CPU. So this is working, I guess uh, it's kind of late in here. So I guess what I'm gonna do to complete the successful evening is to take it inside my house and play some game. I tested this PlayStation yesterday night. I played some games on it, uh, no issues whatsoever. It powers up totally fine, it works totally fine. It's a bit on a warm side, since again, it's the, the fat PlayStations are always uh, kind of warm, but everything works fine. So um, from my point of view, this is totally fixed. And yes, it would need some tweaks, some thermal pads and stuff, but uh, I will leave it to someone else. You'll find out at the end of the video. But for now, this is a successful repair. It's, I would say, my first actually repair PlayStation. Definitely my first deleted, successfully deleted PlayStation. And uh, I'm pretty, feel pretty happy with that. Um, remember, this one has the noisy Blu-ray player. Really nothing I can do with that, I feel. And um, that will need a replacement, either the motor assembly or the whole Blu-ray, uh, besides the daughter board, obviously. So this is it. This is the end of part one of these um, PlayStation 3 repair return series. I'm really happy with the outcome. I've got one PlayStation fully repaired and fully deleted. First time for me. The next step is going to be to move to the yellow light of death PlayStation. So watch the space because the video is going to be out soon. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please hit the like button down below. I would really appreciate that. And also please consider subscribing if you like what I'm doing here on my channel. I hope I see you soon here again on my channel. For now, I wish you a great day and goodbye. Bye-bye.